whenever you're dealing with anything that's got to do with uh, moving the air, you know, back in the day they used vacuum. Now they're using these little uh, actuators that drive the doors this way and that. And uh, the actuators are uh, basically in any system, the problem is typically going to be with the part that's working the hardest. And usually, if it's, it'll either be in a hostile environment or it'll be working really, really hard. And these door actuators have got little plastic gears in them like toys. And they go back and forth and they got a little sensor in them telling the, the little computer where it is. We're going to get a little bit of that here. I'll show you something from what we have here now. This problem becomes our problem and they hire us to fix it. Now, whenever we do, whenever we're wanting to work on something. And I don't know, a lot of people have a sort of a, I don't know what, some, what people have a notion that, you know, you just, osmosis will uh, make you figure out everything else. And, you know, Tim's been around long enough, and, and you have too, to know that uh, you're wanting to get a good solid handle on how everything works so you can figure stuff out. And that's the way that's supposed to be, right? And you know, you've actually done some work before, you know, changing alternators and stuff like that you were talking about. And so you kind of know that sometimes it's not as easy as you think it is, right? There's a lot more to it than just see a bolt, take it out, put it back in. I mean, you basically have to be able to think on your feet. And, uh, Can I turn the AC on? Sit down over a hot shot. Can I turn the AC on? All right. So, it's on. Uh, it's on. Uh, notice the system. symptom. They notice the pattern, they describe the symptom and the pattern, and we have to verify it. That's in a perfect world. A lot of times the customer doesn't even know how to describe the problem that they're having. But we have to put our knowledge and skill to work, and without any knowledge and skill, we're just able to change parts. You know, you better go find out what's wrong first. This Buick Park Avenue had an AC and an operative and a low coolant message. It was constantly displayed on the message center. Now, these can turn on the light if the coolant concentration is not right, or if it's actually low on coolant. They got a little sensor in there in the radiator on this you know, car. And if you, if you put straight water in it, it'll say low coolant. Put straight coolant in it, it'll say low coolant. But if you put the right mix in there, the water it actually doesn't see any coolant in there. So we give it a good once over, check the fuel concentration, and we attack the AC. So this AC system was full of atmosphere. But if it's full of atmosphere, you do not hit recover on the machine to recover atmosphere. You've got to vacuum it first, right? All right, so we did a soap bubble hunt for leaks. Didn't really see anything. Of course, you know, we didn't spray every last little thing of everything either. So we pulled a vacuum. It held 30 inches of vacuum right at the end of the week, end of the day, and all that sort of thing. We put some UV dye in it along with the refrigerant chart, felt it blowing cold, and let her take the car, bring it back for a follow up. Well, when you came back with it, the low coolant message had been joined by a trunk of jar light. And the AC's refrigerant charge had mostly gone away. So we replaced the coolant level sensor, took care of the low coolant message. Trunk of jar light was still there. Really aggravating. It just gets better. Well, you can see the dye that was on the, that's actually looking up at the bottom from the AC compressor. It was all uh, gummy and wet with that yellow dye. And of course, I didn't do a black light picture, but we could tell that the compressor was more leaking. And that's a pretty common leak point on a lot of vehicles in the compressor where the compressor is put together. Now remember what I said a few minutes ago about the hostile environment and the thing is working the hardest? That would be like a compressor right there. Uh, so anyway, we replaced the compressor and the orifice and, and the accumulator. Well, still didn't have any cold air, although when we charged it up the previous week, it had nice cold air and everything's working just like it's supposed to. But it, we knew, you know, but it leaked out over the weekend. All right, so while we were investigating that, one of my guys noticed the temp gauge was really close to the red line and the coolant fans weren't coming on. That was not a problem it had before we charged up the AC the previous time. The loss of compressor operation and the dead coolant fans and the trunk of jar message had all come about over the weekend, but none of these systems that existed during our previous survey. Well, sometimes even a good shot can overthink things. Now this guy took his, uh, this is a different vehicle, this guy basically took his Mitsubishi Raider to a shop and they put the ignition switch on it and charged him $400 when all I really needed was a set of spark plugs. He threw a set of spark plugs in that one and got it straightened out. I don't know why they didn't go after the spark plugs to start with. I mean, because that's actually a pretty good shop. It's just odd to me that they would miss something as obvious as this. One way or another, the Santa Fe AC, there was a, these people had had this thing at, the, uh, at, a, at a dealership somewhere, and they'd spent something like three or $4,000 trying to get the AC fixed, and they'd replaced everything on it. Still wouldn't work. And the guy that I had working on it here, he basically went on the dash and did the little, you know, button push where it goes through your codes. And it told him the little thermistor in the evaporator that keeps it from freezing up was not telling the truth. 
And so we went ahead and uh, pulled the dash out of that one and replaced that little evaporator fin sensor in there and took care of it with a $28 part. Wasn't that big of a deal, but the problem was it was a huge deal getting to it. And, uh, so anyway, back to the Buick. Replace the compressor for a leak, recharge. Now it doesn't engage electrically. So sometimes you've got to back up and say, let me rethink this. Let me see where we've been. Let me see if I can say this is what I know to be truth and this is what I know to be, uh, you know, confusing. Coolant fins are inoperative. Dangerous and extreme. It's going to burn the motor up, right? Trunk and jar lap. Uh, maybe these things are, I don't know, but these are related. Perhaps. Now, they feel like a smack in the face when the customer is expecting a car back the same day without a hitch. You know what I mean? An inoperative coolant fan was something I could not let the car go with the coolant fans not working because they're sitting at a stoplight for a while or a drive through while they're waiting to go around McDonald's or something. A lot will burn it up. Uh, so one simple problem. I got a solution. Yeah. That. The wire in your fan up with a relay to your ignition. Say it again? You're on top. You're all like your, what, let's say, you wire up to your ignition. So when you turn your car on, your, AC, your fan's always on. Yeah, that usually puts a weak link in the chain somewhere that burns up the ignition switch or something like that. But we're basically, we're wanting it to work right, not patched. Okay. So we had to roll up our sleeves and get back to troubleshoot. So I, I put a couple wrong. of guys to work on the trunk ajar message. Find out why this thing thinks the trunk is open when it's not. So you got to say, well, go back here. There's a little switch that tells them when the trunk is open. And they looked at the wires all the way back and all that. We didn't see anything going on. So, well, let's just put that on the back burner because we got other problems that are more important. We'll worry with that later. All right. So now here's the problem. If you get if you get a vehicle and you start working on it, I knew this one guy 15 years ago, and he basically took his car into a uh, an a dealer somewhere. I don't even you know no point in what dealer it was, and the mechanic started working on it. He says this vehicle's running hot. Well, the mechanic started working on it and got sidetracked working on the ignition system trying to make it where it would run nice and wouldn't skip. And spent $500 on that and never addressed the overheating problem. Well, the guy got it back. He paid the $500. He didn't read the work order. He drove a little ways and was sitting in traffic and it, it overheated and destroyed the engine because they didn't fix the overheating problem he wrote it up for. They got sidetracked working on something else and they never even went to work on the overheating problem. See what I'm saying? So who's at fault there? Right? Uh, basically, you got to uh, follow along there. So we don't want to damage the motor. So what we got here is we got these relays. You know, you've seen this setup we got over here where you wire up the relay so that the fan runs at half speed whenever you turn them on at full speed when you kick it on high. And all that's wired up the same way. Physically finding the relays and then determining which pin goes where is not that hard. Neither is using the schematic to see how they're wired. So you got a coolant fan one relay and a coolant fan zero parallel relay. Uh, over there. All right, but we tested the fans first. Now, you remember what I told you about testing the fans? You basically, this is how this works whenever it's running in. It's going through that motor, through that relay, and through that other motor. It's the same way this board over here will be wired up when you wire it up. Six volt, six volts. Fans running in series. That's when it's running at half speed. Your low fan, fan relay control, there's your two switches on your board over there, is basically going to operate that relay, and when that relay kicks on, you got to run it like that. But then, whenever you turn on the half fan relay control, that one switches, and the rest of them, both of them run on 12 volts, because now this one is getting a straight ground to that one, and this one is grounded too, because you're actually using, you're clicking two relays when you turn on the high speed fan control. We were going through all of that, pull the coolant fan, one, connect the test light to B plus, the light should light, turn the fan to watch the light. We went through this on a vehicle a while back. We went out there, turned it through, found out we had a bad coolant fan. This one here, we didn't really see anything like that. We removed the coolant fan, we go from the battery to there with the light. All right, with a two-way talking scan tool, we told the PCM to turn on the fans, and it did on both speeds, okay? Well, the ECT sensor disconnected, the PCM would also activate the fans, but at low speed. So, you know, when you pull the ECT sensor, if it doesn't know what it is, it runs them for safety reasons. Right. So what we knew was that everything was in place, driver circuits, good relays, good fans, so the PCM had the ability to operate the fans, but for some stupid reason, it was choosing not to. See what I mean? Now, we're going to dig into this. Can we cool it into turning on the fans by making it think the engine was hot? Engine coolant sensor. Engine coolant sensor was not what the problem was. So here I'll show you why we knew that. 
what we did was we get a potentiometer, zero to 50,000 ohms. We disconnect the engine coolant temperature sensor. We install a zero to 50K pot, and we turn the knob and watch the temperature reading on the scan tool, because now we've got our own little input, right? Okay. That's how this looks. See that? That ain't complicated if you got the right pot. All right, using a 50,000 potentiometer connected to the ECT's yellow wire, we started the engine and watching the scan tool, we dialed a temperature of 267 degrees, which would have wiped it out. <laughs> but that, that was, we, fo we fooled it into thinking it was that hot. But the PCO still wouldn't turn on the fan. All right, even though it was seeing engine destroying temperatures on the ECT pit. So what, what the heck is going on here? All right, so we peeked into the data stream. We saw an AC request. It said no. Commanded AC off. AC high side pressure, you know, so on and so forth. AC pressure out of range, no. For the AC, the scan tool showed the control head was sending a request, and the BCM, let me back that up. And the BCM was receiving a request, but that's where the request stopped. BCM would not message the PCM to turn on the AC. See, the body controller is a different box. It's in there behind the glove box. And it's basically going to talk to the engine controller and tell it to turn on the fan. All right, so the BCM was telling us via the data stream, the PCM data stream verified the lack of request. It didn't even know the AC was on, so it didn't ever energize, energize the compressor and all that. So this is sort of getting interesting. This isn't a voltage deal you can measure or even interpret with a scope. It's a class two message transfer between two modules. It's a network. It's a computer talking. All right, so it's kind of hard to track with anything but a scan tool. PCM software, well, you know, let's do a reflash. So we went ahead and did the reflash and we figured we're going to try that, you know, so that didn't really cost much of anything. We just hooked up and did the GM reflash deal, uh, service programming, all right. Identifix was the next stop, and the post on this problem reflected issues with the VCM, PCM, wire and so on. I didn't notice any silver bullets, right? You're always looking for a silver bullet. You go here, you tighten this screw, you fix this wire, and it fixes everything. That ain't happening this time around. All right, so I checked the DM dealer to see if I found a replacement BCM runs about $400. Outstanding performance, right? All right, the non-starter as far as I was concerned, so I called the salvage yard and said they had one on here for $45. Bucks. Well, we got to lose. Let's go ahead and see about that. So I went by and picked it up. When it was installed, nothing had changed either on the LCD scan tool screen or the vehicle itself. The fans and the AC were both dead. But, got a really tough one to look like. I wait everybody go, just let everybody go. And I worked on it by myself, nobody bothered me. Now what I found out was, they gave me an HVAC programmer instead of a BCM. They're mounted right next to each other, under the, and they look real similar. Except one of them has pink terminals, and the other one has gray terminals. Got it? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? All right, so I went back over there and I brought them that one back. I said, I didn't want an HVAC programmer, which is what operates all your doors and all that stuff and reads all your pressures and everything. I want a BCM, body control module. All right, so because the two boxes were mounted right next to each other, easy to make a mistake. Plug the BCM in the Buick, everything came online. Everything started working. The cooling fan began to operate normally and the trunk and warning light went away. Body controller within, had its fingers in that pie too. Change all cinema came on. All because of that box. Now, I'm the last person, I don't, I don't want to just throw a box at something because for years, whenever the computer started appearing on cars, people throw that on there first because it was easy to change and they just wanted to blame everything on it. Most of the time, that ain't what it is. In this particular time, it was. After the oil change was done, the bill was paid, she got her wheels back. Everything was working smooth, but two weeks later, she was back with harsh transmission shifts. And a stalling concern. One of the brakes checked for pulsation. Transmission had harsh two, three, and three, four shifts, and it would stall sometimes during parking lot maneuvers. And the mill was on with a mass airflow code. We hadn't seen that previously on this car. Well, the PCM data stream showed a mass airflow reading of 1,000 hertz lower than normal, and when the mass airflow sensor from the park store cleaned up its act. The mass airflow sensor will make you feel like you've got a transmission problem that's really nasty on one of these vehicles, of these GM vintage. You know, that's, that wasn't the first time I'd seen that. Uh, oh, there was an old mobile that came in here, and the guy just knew his wife had messed the transmission up some kind of way, and all it needed was a mass airflow sensor to you know, take care of it. But you gotta be able to look at it and figure out what it was. Buick had it in for us, but we won in the end. All right, somebody probably had this problem intermittently. No AC, no coolant fan operation because they replaced that relay right there. You can tell it really has been replaced. 
See, all the rest of the relays were the factory relays and that had been replaced. Traded the car in, let somebody else do it. And the owner had only bought it a couple of weeks earlier from Carlisle. All right, the tough ones work us over. Now, the ones that you're going to always remember are the ones that beat you up. The one that beats you up is the one you're going to remember. If everything fixes real easy, you know, Katie will always remember how much trouble she had with that back spark plug on her truck back there. And, uh, you know, but one of the things I'm always telling you guys, people do this kind of work every day. You know what I mean? I mean, there's mechanics out there every day. They don't have anybody to ask them to help. They just got to get it done. You know what I mean? And if you're, if you're a wuss, you ain't never going to make it in this business. <laughs> That's all there is to it. You got to be tough. You can't be, you know, somebody that calls for the calf rope every time you're going into a little bit of a problem. And all that. That's the end of the tip. What did you learn from that? Now, your, uh, your issue with your uh, actuators, um, what you got over there is you basically have unresponsive actuators. Now, let me see over there. Uh, give me an actuator. There should be some right up there. There's a real easy one to grab. Give me that, uh, Nick, give me that white one up there. That one I'm shining my laser. All right, let me see that. That is the that is the blend door actuator off of a different vehicle, a different kind of vehicle. And what you got in there, inside an actuator, and they're all similar, you know, some of them require different procedures to program them when you change them out and all that. And what you got inside an actuator, and it's basically moving a door in the dash so that the you got a mode actuator that decides whether it's going to the floor or the defrost or the register uh, out in your face, or you've got a, uh, and then you got a blend door actuator. This is a blend door actuator. See how they made on the inside? You got a little motor in there, and that little motor drives this, but watch what happens when I unstack that. All right, so um, there's care. See that? See that little? It's like a potentiometer, like a throttle position sensor. What it does is it slides on that resistive paint so that the system will know where the door is. You know what I mean? Now, if it gets to the point that where one of the, a lot, most of what usually happens on these is one of the teeth will break off of one of these little gears. And whenever, and you'll hear it under the dash, particularly on a GM going pop, 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 because it's trying to move it and that little broken tooth is there. And so, Basically, what you're going to have here, and is really, really common on that one, that envoy you're looking at over there, you're going to be looking at some, uh, you know, actuators. You see a, you see enough of those, you get to where you're, you know, pretty well. Uh, and once you get the kind of uh, results you're getting on your scan tool, you know the actuator is your problem. When you're pulling the actuator out, like let's say that you've got an actuator, you've decided that's what's wrong with it. You pull the actuator out. And I like to take the, the old actuator apart and, and stick this up in the little door it's supposed to be driving and try to move it with my fingers. And if I were to stick this up in there and it goes doo, 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 I said, I know it's not a bound up door because kids throw pencils and stuff on the dash and they fall down and then they foul the door and stuff like that, you know. So it, it basically, if you're looking at a situation where you can move it with your fingers but this won't move it and, you know, the, the wiring is only a problem very, very, very seldom. Almost never had a problem with wiring. Uh, the control head can be an issue. Like on some of your Chevy pickups, like a mid 2000s a control head has to be replaced fairly regularly because, mm -hmm. like for example, if you're driving along and one side will be hot all the time and the other side will work right, you know, no matter, or they have to go up and down with it some and all that. So you've got to replace those, but whenever you're replacing a control head, you've got to make sure you're following procedures so that that new control head knows where the stops on all the doors are. You know, that's not so terribly complicated. Once you get your head wrapped around it, it's not a big deal. Now, the hard part of that deal over there is getting to the actuators. Because you got to pull this and that and the other, and the whole dash has got to come off and the, all this. And then when you finally get in there where you can get to the actuator, don't get so caught up on it. If you get it in there where you can actually get the actuator out and back in, that's where you stop disassembling. <laughs> you change this sucker out because that's your, you know, wherever it happens to be. Once you get that changed out, then you put everything back together. Don't take it all the way apart just for the sake of taking it apart. That's silly. You're, you're costing yourself a lot of work and all that, you know. But, um, anyway, that's the long and the short of that. Did, 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 is this any clearer to you than it was before I started talking? A little bit? Okay. We'll try to get you something, something that you can see how it works under there. That green GMC is a good one to look under the dash 
with a flashlight and turn the knobs and you can watch what the doors are doing under there. I mean, watch what the actuators are doing. And we have to replace those in the too. They told so. me I had to take my whole, my whole dash out. Mm -hmm. Just replace my heater core. Yeah, I know. That's the way that usually goes. Nope. And you got on top of the, uh, you got on top. Oh, you mean you didn't have to on that S10? No, yeah. They, everybody that yeah. I talked to about taking No, you don't board. have to always take the whole dash out on all Oh, those. I didn't. I'm bought one and I pushed it back. Some of those early it's 90s, it's real easy, you know. But uh, you got on top of some water this, this uh, weekend, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. So he went off the ditch. Yeah. 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 So, did, yeah, I mean, did, did you have you had bad, bad tires or what was your deal? No, it was just... You didn't have bad tires. You just got on top of the water. Yeah. Were you driving crazy? Nope. You weren't driving crazy? He's you being careful. five miles up over the speed limit. And five went, miles up over the speed limit? Under. Under the speed limit. Hard yeah. rain? Yes, it just started raining. Like now, what was going through your mind when you turned the wheels and the vehicle kept going straight? I said, you know what? There was a hill and there was a ditch. And I said, there ain't no way I'm going to make it in that ditch. So I floored it and I popped that ditch over it and I jumped over it. Oh, yeah, he was. your brother said you did a Dukes of Hazard jump with your truck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what made the tire come off the bead. <laughs> that's good stuff. All right.